When I asked you four years ago, I said, what unites all these, I call them battles, you were not sure they were battles, I don't know what you want to call them, right. um, uh, incidents, um, interactions mm -hmm. with the Wall Street company, that's a polite word. Right. When I asked what united them, he said, very simple, we were right, they were wrong. Mm -hmm. They strayed from basic ethical mandates. Mm -hmm. And in the movie that I talked about, when you had an open negotiation with former Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno, at one point you stop and you say, Joe, it's very simple. We're right, you're wrong. Now that was a joke, but, but yeah, okay. Okay. I mean, we were talking some arcane point right. of policy. The first part, though, was not. Yes, that's okay. correct. And what this brings up, inevitably, is what people will say to you, this, what chutzpah right. for you to be talking this way given what happened? And I'm curious what, since you have obviously, you know that that is a response. What's your, what do you say to, assuming you have this dialogue, I don't know that you actually do it face to face, right. but what do you say, what's your response to that notion? Well, of course, there, there's a certain degree of folks when saying we're right, you're wrong, but I think there are certain moments when you can say, wait a minute, we are fundamentally rebuilding an economic structure or rebuilding a state, and if the individuals, entities you're dealing with are doing nothing but rebuilding it as it was, and you are persistently, as we were trying to do, whether it was Wall Street or whether it was healthcare reform here in the state or education reform, whatever it may have been, trying to build in a new direction with a new foundation, it is very hard to change the status quo. And sometimes you have to push very aggressively to do so. And in that dynamic back and forth, you have to look at people and say, look, this isn't something where there will merely be the traditional compromise where we will do what Albany has done for 50 years, which is split the baby and expand spending, et cetera, et cetera. You have to say, no, we can't do that because it simply won't work, here is why. And we just think you're wrong. And use, that, that is what elections are about. Right. That is what electoral mandates are about. And I think, frankly, that is what many people wanted President Obama to be doing more of in his first year in office, when he was trying to engage and negotiate, 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 didn't get very far, recently saying, here are the rules, here are the principles, he's been much more successful. So, so I think there is that mandate that you have to use. But with respect, when people will say what chutzpah, mm -hmm. what they are saying to be impolite about is, who are you to tell people about strain from ethical mandates? You're right, and, and the answer is they're right. They're, they're right, and I, I, I make no bones about that, that they are right, and I also say the, uh, the obligation I had as governor, the obligation I had as attorney general, was to do my best to bring to the policy arena, whether as a prosecutor or as a governor, the best answers we could get to issues that were clearly strangling our economy, strangling our state. And we did everything we could to do that, pushing back against the pre-existing forces. Now, that leads to some of that tension and leads to a moment when you have to use that, that force of personality that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Some people call it chutzpah. When you were last here, we talked about Wall Street and whether it was a case of rotten apples or a rotten barrel. And what you, one of the things you said was, most of these companies are stronger today, this is 2006, because they've gone back to their core principles. Right. Now in retrospect, that seems rather optimistic. Right, well, the, the, so with respect to many of the companies we dealt with, it is true. Well, I'm getting to a broader point right. here. Did the financial meltdown that almost destroyed the economy happen in some or large measure, because the, these companies and other companies, in fact, strayed from their core principles. Yes, they, they strayed. Okay, there's so many causative factors that, that it doesn't lend itself to a simple yes or no answer to that question. So let me step back for a moment. The, the fundamental error was embracing an ideology of essentially libertarianism that began with President Reagan and a belief in self-regulation a belief in financial markets that could control themselves, and a belief that CEOs who were running financial companies would end up doing what was right despite the enormous pressures to act in ways that were both ethically wrong and create thereby business models that would lead to collapse. Government failed to use its proper power. Businesses went down a path that was doomed to failure. And the convergence of those two led to the cataclysm of the last two years. The answer to this is both on the governmental side, reimposing a regulatory framework that works, 
And on the business side, taking banks that are doing so many different things, and if we discuss the Goldman case, I think that is its critical importance, doing so many things that there are inherent conflicts and tensions that will inevitably lead to a cataclysm. Short way to, put, to ask this question is if, you ha if, if, if for some reason you had remained Attorney General over these last sure. four years, um, do you think your, is there reason to think that your office would have been able to do something in the area of the credit default swaps, the massive leveraging no. to have stopped this? No, I, I don't think anybody can legitimately look back and say this person, that person could have, a few regulatory bodies, the New York Fed could have stopped it. The Washington, D.C. Fed could have stopped it. So they, with their expansive jurisdiction, other than those entities, I don't think there's any prosecutorial office that could have or would have been in a position to stop it. There's, by no means would I ever say we, were, we, we would have or could have, because there was, we didn't have the capacity. We were trying to shine a light on some of the fundamental structural issues on the street whether it was analysts, the marketing of insurance, mutual funds, on and on. But I would never maintain that we actually could have stopped the cataclysm. Okay, so let's, if we look then at the, at, at the forces that might have been able to stop it or that in fact helped put it in motion. Um, President Clinton said recently that the guidance he was getting from his team, mm -hmm. Larry Summers, Bob Rubin, about deregulation, about opening all this up, about these inventive financial... Right instruments were was wrong correct and that he, and that in in following it he took on some responsibility now so here's my question when you saw now that when you look at the team that Barack Obama has put in place to guide his economic mm -hmm. policy uh, does it give you pause it gives me much more than give me pause but what, I mean, does what, it do what, <laughs> what I've said is that this is continuity you can believe in we, we went from Bernanke, Paulson, Geithner, and Summers to Geithner, Summers, Bernanke, and Paulson is no longer there. But this is the same team, the same ideological approach, and that is why for the first year of the Obama administration, and we can talk in some greater detail about what they did properly and what fundamentally they did not, in my view, and I think it is now generally accepted that some, there were some errors along the way, they did not bring in the thinking of a Paul Volcker, although he was in the campaign. Right. Paul Volcker and his much more strategic thinking about what needed to change was not, Paul Volcker was not part, as he should have been, of the restructuring agenda. Paul Krugman was not part of it. Joe Stiglitz was not part of it. There was an entire school of economic theory that wanted a much more fundamental shift in the structure of finance and banking than what was initially proposed by the Obama administration. Now, the bill that will be passed, presumably in the next week or two weeks in the Senate, and then uh, brought together with the House, is much better than what was initially proposed because there's been enormous pressure placed upon the White House by not only Paul Volcker, but by Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz and others who, Simon Johnson, if you haven't read 13 Bankers, uh, you should. I mean, th this is free fall by Joe, by Joe Stiglitz. There, there are books out there that created a powerful academic argument that simply rebuilding the same edifice, which is what Larry Summers and Tim Geithner wanted to do, was going to push us farther down the path at risk. Right, and what seems to be the case is that the people you've mentioned, and I've interviewed Simon Johnson, who, who, who looks like he walked out of a British movie about the city. You know, he's the yep. most, he's a, he was a former chief economist for the International Monetary Fund, who basically is beginning to talk now like Huey Long. Right. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I exaggerate a little bit, but well, basically, look, well, he, not much. I mean, he basically thinks that these are really bad guys running things, and you need to break them up, and you need to bring the power of government you know, like, an, like a hammer on them. And uh, what I'm getting at is, on the other hand, you have Mike Bloomberg, right. and to some extent, until he either saw the light or felt the heat, Chuck Schumer, saying, if you, <laughs> mess, heat. Okay, if, if you mess around with Wall Street, you're going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. You're going to cost right. the city hundreds well, of millions of dollars. The, 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 they're viewing this, the, the mayor is viewing this through the prism of a mayor of a city. Looking at these business organizations that contribute significant tax revenue to the city and the state. That's fine, but that is a narrow prism through which to view it. I think Mike is, he's a friend, but I think he's fundamentally in error when he talks about hesitating before we change the structure of banking. The structure of banking is what brought us to the precipice. It destroyed our economy. It has made us subservient to China. Let's be clear, 
For 50 years, between the Depression and the mid-1970s, mid-1980s, we did not have a significant banking crisis because there was a regulatory framework that worked, that limited the size of banks, limited what they could do, and when those laws were repealed, when we began to repeat the mantra of self-regulation and believed that the banks would act not only in their interest but in the interest of the public and the economy, we all were destroyed. And so let's learn the historical lesson. Banking is a mechanism, it is not the end in itself. Synthetic CDOs arguably should not exist. These are creatures of remarkably creative minds on Wall Street who know how to create a casino but do not, do not know how to create an economy. We need to change this model.